you turn it in your Bible to Genesis chapter 39, chapter 39, <clears throat> the past couple of weeks we began looking into the account of the life of Joseph. We began that in Genesis chapter 37 where uh, we were introduced to Joseph and his brothers how that he was his father's favorite and his brother's least favorite. They had plotted and attempted to take his life, but they changed their mind and decided they would sell him instead. In fact, he was sold to a group of Ishmaelites or Midianites. If you remember, I, I told you that Ishmaelites were their uh, name that indicated their heritage and Midianites was the name they went by referring to the location that they were from. So these are the same people. They just are, are called by two different names. Um, so they sold their brother, um, their youngest one at the time, Benjamin comes along a little bit later, uh, but they sold their youngest brother for 20 shekels of silver and they returned home with his famed multicolored robe and they didn't say anything to their father other than do you recognize this does it belong to your son and they allowed him to draw his own conclusion as to what happened to joseph and jacob sees the robe he sees the blood on it because the brothers had um, sacrificed or uh, the bible says slaughtered uh, a goat and dipped uh, his robe in the blood of that goat and uh, when they presented the robe to Jacob their father and said do you recognize this does this belong to your son uh, he immediately jumps to the conclusion that Joseph has been attacked and killed by some wild animal and the Bible tells us that he uh, began to mourn and uh, he, he prepared himself and and sat in mourning and and he said surely i will go down to sheol or, or or basically he was saying i'll go to my grave mourning for my son and that's kind of where we left off there in um chapter 37 but the last verse the last line of 37 tells us that those ishmaelites sold joseph to an egyptian official named potiphar and so then chapter 38 kind of sidebars, goes off on a tangent about one of the brothers and, and some of the things that, that he did later on in life. And so uh, we're mainly going to focus on Joseph throughout these uh, messages and this study. So we're going to skip 38 and you know maybe one day we'll come back to it at, a, at an appropriate time when uh, we're studying about uh, the, the tribe of Judah, which is uh, what chapter 38 is about. Uh, one of the bro Joseph's brothers named Judah. And so we're going to catch up in chapter 39. And so uh, we're going to look at the first six verses today uh, that kind of give us the uh, time and the place of where Joseph finds himself in Egypt, having been sold by his brothers to a band of Ishmaelite um, traders uh, and they, they obviously dealt in everything. Uh, if you look at the list of things that, that they were carrying as they were making their way down to Egypt to, to trade and to barter and to sell, and um, they obviously were, were into uh, human trafficking and, and selling people and slavery. And so uh, it says in verse 1 of chapter 39, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him, referring to Joseph, down there, referring to Egypt. And it says in verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. And so he became a successful man. And so just reading that phrase, he became a successful man. Remember, he's 17 at the time that we're introduced to him and the things that are going on with uh, the, the animosity and, and the hatred and the ill feelings from his brothers that eventually decided to kill him and then they sold him. And so 
this is a transitional period for Joseph. He's coming from his later teenage years into adulthood as, as we know it. But it says there that he became a successful man. Well, in, in my mind, when I read that statement, based on what we just read in verse 1, how could a slave become successful? Well, the answer is the first part that we read in verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. You see, we define success in many different ways than what the Lord defines as success. So reading on, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And verse 3, it says, his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, referring to Potiphar, and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge. It came about that from that time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on the account of Joseph, or because of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned, and in the house, and in the field. And so everything he owned in Joseph's charge and with him there, he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. And then that last line kind of gives us a description about Joseph, uh, kind of re referring to what's about to be told in the next few verses. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. We, we, would, we would look at Joseph and say that he was a good-looking man, young man, he was kind of athletic looking, probably uh, what we would refer to as country strong, you know? And he'd probably do just about anything, and it seemed like it was no effort at all. Uh, and so uh, Joseph will kind of get, get an idea not only of where he's at in these verses, but how the Lord's with him, the kind of work and the thing that he's involved in, in doing for Potiphar, but also that, that he is, uh, you know, physically fit, that, that you know, he's, he's still young during this time and uh, capable and able to do these things. And so, you know, as, as we get into looking at these verses, you know, it, it's, it's awful to think that the brothers sold him into slavery. It's awful to think that they allowed their father to believe what he believed that would have, uh, or what, what he believed to be the demise of his own son, his youngest son at the time, his, his favorite son. But then we, we kind of are distracted from that fact about the brothers and their relationship with their, with their brother and their relationship with their father. And we're kind of brought to Egypt. We're there with Joseph. And the, the writers are telling us the exact and specific things that, that Joseph was doing. Now, when you look at who Potiphar was, we know a little bit about him based on his name. We know that uh, the name Potiphar means devoted to the sun. And this had everything to do with the uh, Egyptian religious system. They had many gods, you know, uh, they worshiped the sun god and the moon god and all this other kind of stuff. And, and so uh, kind of like uh, in, in any ancient culture, a name had a significance. It wasn't just what the, the parents liked or agreed upon to call their child, but the name had some sort of religious significance most of the time. And uh, so Potiphar, it, we are told, was an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh. So we know that Pharaoh is the, the, the highest authority in Egypt. And this uh, particular man, Potiphar, uh, was an Egyptian officer. And it says he was the captain of the bodyguard. Now, kind of two things that, that we have to point out here that will kind of illuminate 
the situation that Joseph finds himself in, in a little bit later. Um, the ancient Hebrew word for officer was a very similar word to the word eunuch. And that just simply means a, a, a male who um, had had some things uh, personally happen to him so that he would uh, be uh, sterile. We'll put it that way. And he could not reproduce children. And so his life's mission, his life's devotion was in service to the Pharaoh. He had an official title. He had all the official um, perks, if you will. He had all the things um, that a government official would have had at his disposal in that time and in that culture. And so we don't know for sure if that's what Potiphar was, if, if he was being described as an officer, the highest ranking officer of the bodyguard of Pharaoh. Basically, it means that he was the, the, the chief of security. He was responsible for the safety, the personal safety of the Pharaoh. Um, you know, you, you think about uh, in, in our nation, the Secret Service. They're in charge of the personal safety of the president of the United States. And so Potiphar would have been the head of the uh, Secret Service, the the personal security of Pharaoh. Now, that term that's translated as officer or eunuch was kind of used interchangeably in later years uh, to kind of signify that it was a high-ranking official. Um, it was often assumed that anybody who had a title like Potiphar had was um, a eunuch, but, it's, but it, we don't know for sure, but we kind of speculate that he was. And so he was, as I said, captain of the guard, and he buys Joseph from the Ishmaelites. Now, obviously, they paid 20 shekels of silver for Joseph to his brothers. So you got 10 brothers, 20 shekels. They got two apiece, right? Just, just doing the easy math. So the Ishmaelites would have sold Joseph, and we don't know how much for but we know that they were there to make a profit because they were there to sell goods and trade. And so Potiphar, being a high-ranking official, would have been a wealthy man and could have purchased whatever he desired. And so he buys this Hebrew boy, 17-year-old, 18-year-old maybe at the time, Hebrew boy, young man, and he uh, enlists him into his service in his household. And so... Uh, Joseph was a slave. He had no control over his life at that time. And in particular, from the moment that his brothers threw him down in that dry well, in that empty cistern, he had no control over his destiny. There was no way he could have gotten out of that pit. There's no way after being what we assume to be bound and handed over to the Ishmaelites and then sold in that same fashion to Potiphar. He had no control over his destiny. He was at the, the, the mercy of those who were overseeing him on this, this journey down to Egypt. He was bought and sold like a piece of property. Like we would buy and sell land. Like we would buy and sell a car or a vehicle, or an ATV, or furniture. Just think about that. How that, even to this day, people are bought and sold. Kind of gives you a chill on the back of your spine, doesn't it? Joseph was bought and he could have ended up with anyone that had enough money to satisfy the Ishmaelites asking price. But he went to Potiphar, the highest ranking official in Pharaoh's court. Pharaoh being the highest authority in all of Egypt. And in verses 2 and 3, tells us, as we've already mentioned, the Lord was with Joseph. He became a successful man. And then notice that in 
um, verse 3, it says, His master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him. So twice we are told in consecutive verses that the Lord was with Joseph. Now we all know that when the Bible tells us something twice, it's kind of saying in an under, uh, underlying message, pay attention. Don't miss this. Catch this, what we're about to teach you, what we're about to show you, what we're about to tell you. Pay attention. So the Lord was with Joseph. He was a successful man. And Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him. And the Lord made all that Joseph did to prosper in his hand. Meaning everything that Joseph attempted to do, everything that he was tasked to do by Potiphar, everything that eventually he would be put in charge of by Potiphar was successful because the Lord was with him. The Lord caused Joseph to be successful. And so you look at his situation and, and everything that he had gone through up to this point was, was a big deal. In our eyes, everything Joseph was experiencing was negative. In our eyes, everything Joseph was experiencing was an unnecessary hardship. And when we look at our current situation, or maybe something difficult that we've just gone through, we look at it and we say, that was a bad situation. That was hard. That was difficult. And it, and it is. Don't get me wrong. and Don't, don't let me misspeak. But we often miss the fact of what it says in verse 2, the Lord was with you. We don't always look back and see the moments where God was with us, God's hand was upon us, or God was using us to reveal himself to other people. Because the Lord was with Joseph and Potiphar noticed. Potiphar saw the difference in Joseph. And so God was being revealed as being real to Potiphar. We sometimes complain about difficult situations. We, we, we fuss and we, we groan and we sometimes we even say, God, why, why did you bring me to this? Why did you put me here? And it always goes back to, to the same thing that, that I've said, that you've heard me say, that we read in Scripture. It's for our good. It might seem negative, but it's for our good. It's molding us and shaping us and transforming us because of our dependence and our greater dependence upon God in that difficult situation. Our faith grows, our reliance on God and His strength and his support to get us out of that difficult situation or that difficult season, however long it may be. God's will is that we trust him as he blesses us and makes us successful in his definition of success, not our definition of success. And that's the one thing that we're so short-sighted on as, as Christians in, in 2024, we tend to measure success as the world does because success is looked at as how fast you can rise, how fast you can make it, how fast you can grow your bank account, how quickly you can have something come under your authority rather than the process that gets you there that brings the honor and the glory to the Lord. You know, sometimes we, we use a lot of sports analogies to kind of help us grasp something. And, and in recent years, a lot of football coaches would say, trust the process. And they have an end goal in mind for your success as a football player. Baseball, same way. Basketball, same way. The big three, right? Football, baseball, basketball. When your coach teaches you or when your coach shows you something or when your coach describes to you something that he desires for you to do, 
It's a part of the process to get you to be the best particular player that you can be. If you listen to instruction, if you follow their advice, if you put into practice what they are telling you and teaching you, you will become successful. Not by your standards, but by your coach's standards. And ultimately, if everybody on the team that's participating is successful by the coach's standards, then as a team, they can be successful. Same way with, with individual sports. You're coached, you're trained, and you become successful by your coach's standards, and that helps you to achieve the, the success by the, by the standards of the sport that you are involved in. And so Joseph, we look at him and we say, he was sold by his brothers, father believed him to be dead, and here he is a slave. God was with him. God never left him. We know that Joseph went from the pit to eventually the palace. And God was with him the whole time. Spurgeon said, externally it did not always appear that God was with him, for he did not always seem to be a prosperous man. But when you come to look at the inmost soul of this servant of God, you see his true likeness. He lived in communion with the Most High, and God blessed him. So you see, it's not always our the, the external appearance of our circumstances, but it's the inward workings, the inward things that we do in our relationship with God that determines our success by God's standards. Some people think that they can't have success unless they are the person in charge. They think they can't have success unless everyone recognizes them for having achieved. Some people think that they can't have success unless everyone knows their name. And that's not always the case. Jesus taught and lived in a way and he promoted the life of a servant. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, learn to be the servant of all. Servant, slave. Very similar words. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 20, for the son of man, referring to himself, did not come to be served, but rather he came to serve. One of the titles that Jesus has given and referred to in Matthew chapter 12 and again in Isaiah 42 back in the Old Testament is the servant of the Lord. So you see, sometimes our attitudes and our culture says you, 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 but Jesus says, others, others, others. Believers can, that means we have the ability, but we also must, that means it's imperative for us to learn to serve others. You know, the, the, the golden rule, we've all quoted it and 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 said it in often different times and different situations, but treat others the way that you want to be treated. Which ultimately boils down to this simple fact. Give what you need. Give what you need. If you treat people in a certain way, they're going to respond to you in a certain way. If you and and this is true, you know, in everyday life, if you give someone respect and you're cordial with them, you get that back. If you're friendly with someone, most of the time you get friendliness back. 
So Joseph finds himself in the position of a servant, a slave. And, and it says that he was a successful man, even to the point from having no control over his situation and, and no control over his circumstance, but God overruled all those things from the choices that were made on Joseph's behalf by his brothers. They chose to put him in that pit, to sell him, and then the Ishmaelites sold him to Potiphar, and then Potiphar puts him into service. He had no control over that, but God had control over the eternal purposes that, that were going to affect Joseph and ultimately, later on, the nation of, of Egypt and Joseph's brothers and Joseph's father. All these things are going to be affected by Joseph because God was with him. Moving on, verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him because Joseph trusted in God. He was a diligent worker, and he was blessed by God. Joseph was revealing to Potiphar that God was real, that, that Potiphar began to notice something different about this Hebrew boy. Followers of Jesus, we should take that same approach. We're not working, we're not serving but for one goal, and that is to honor and glorify God. In fact, we ought to make sure that other people see that we're different because of the impact that Jesus has had on our life. Paul said in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly. Full effort, max effort, as if you're working for the Lord, as if Jesus is your boss, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance because you serve the Lord Christ. You see, when you willingly submit to an authority, you become the servant of that authority. Joseph really didn't have a choice because he was bought and sold into the service of Potiphar. But yet he went above and beyond. He did his job so well that Potiphar took notice. You think about the contrast here in this situation between Joseph and his brothers. Joseph was a slave, but he was free. Potiphar began to put him in charge of everything. And then you have Joseph's ten brothers. They were free, but for all those years they were slave to the secret that they hid, to the guilt that they carried, and the shame associated with it for how that they had treated their brother and ultimately how they treated their father. Verses 4 through 6 talk about how Joseph found favor in Potiphar's side. He became his personal servant. So among Potiphar's servants, Joseph was elevated to the highest position in Potiphar's house. In verse 5, it says uh, that uh, from that time, he made him overseer of his house over all that he owned. And the Lord blessed and in verse 6, it says, everything he owned was in Joseph's charge. Hey, Potiphar didn't have to worry about anything except what he was going to have for supper. Basically, that's what verse 6 tells us. He did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. That was all Potiphar was ever worried about. What's for breakfast? What's for lunch? What's for supper? <clears throat> Joseph had everything else handy. It was all taken care of. Potiphar had no cares, concerns, or worries except what his next meal was going to be. That must be a pretty relaxed state of mind. Because God had blessed Joseph, Potiphar had taken notice, and then Potiphar's household became successful. Everything that Joseph did 
from the managing of the home to the managing of, of the land, the, the crops, everything. Everything that Potiphar had business dealings with that Joseph was associated with was successful, which made Potiphar successful. By the world standards, Joseph was successful by God's standards. Think of Joseph's position. It probably was difficult. It's probably a hard spot to be in and he was a slave. But God was with him. Joseph didn't kind of walk around with his head down, wait for a better situation to come along. Maybe, you know, hey, maybe I'll get purchased by someone who's better than Potiphar. There wasn't anybody in the land of Egypt better than Potiphar other than Pharaoh. But God was with him. God blessed him. God made him successful. And, and we often, even as Christians, feel like we have to earn God's favor sometimes. We think, well, if I do this and this, and that becomes pleasing to God, then he's going to bless me. It doesn't work like that. And we know it doesn't work like that. And we know better than to think that. When we trust that God will be there, that God is there, and we trust that he has kept and will keep his promises, that he will be faithful to us even though we don't deserve his faithfulness, he can and he will bless us because we're trusting in him, not ourselves. Not trusting what we can accomplish, but what can be accomplished with us through God's help. So all of Potiphar's household was blessed. Paul in the New Testament talks about a home being blessed when he's talking about husbands and wives and, and, and one of them being a believer and the other not. He says, because of the one, referring to the believer, the other is blessed. So God can use any situation. God can work in any situation, and God can bless. And there's evidence that he can and that he does and that he will in any situation because of the faithfulness of one. You think about where Joseph was to where he's come to now, just in dealing with Potiphar and his, and his household. All that he had he left in Joseph's hand, meaning that it was in his charge, in his care. Joseph oversaw everything for Potiphar. But it took a while for those things to happen. And you look at what we know in um, chapters ahead. So Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery, according to what we've read in Genesis chapter 37. We read in Genesis 41 that he was about 30 years old when Pharaoh promoted him. Not Potiphar, Pharaoh. So we're, we're kind of looking future forward here. And we know that Joseph spent two years in prison before Pharaoh promoted him. And so 17 to 30, two years in prison, Joseph was with Potiphar for 11 years. And it didn't happen in an instant, all the things that he was put in charge of. It was, it was gradual. It was an escalation of his authority under Potiphar's, uh, over Potiphar's house. It took 11 years for the full measure of God's blessing to be evident on the life of Joseph. So wherever you are, wherever we are, just know that tomorrow might not be it. It took Joseph 11 years, and he's still a slave. 
He does nothing under his own authority except what authority has been given to him by Potiphar. And as Christians, we don't operate under our own authority. We, we operate under the authority given to us by the Spirit of God. Because we have been given the Spirit of God through our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. It seems as if Joseph was a hard-working fellow. Even though what we read about him in previous verses kind of indicates that he didn't have to work. But he learned some things. He had observed, probably helped his brothers, shepherding flocks in the field. <clears throat> but think about this. The 11 years that he spent under Potiphar, he goes down into Egypt as a Hebrew young man. He does not know their language. He does not know their culture. He does not know their customs. He does not know anything about Egyptian ways. So not only does he have a job to do for Potiphar, but he has a personal job that he's imposed upon himself to begin to learn these other things and these customs and their language and their ways. So you see, it wasn't instant success for Joseph. He still had to put forth effort. Does that work? Can I get the word into my head just by putting it up there? I wish it would. But it takes effort. It takes diligence. It takes years of study. But we got to commit to it. We got to want to. We got to want to. When we leave all that we have in Jesus' hands. He can make us successful. Our personal lives, our homes, our jobs, all those things will be changed by the evidence of Jesus in our lives. Other people will notice, like Potiphar noticed, Joseph was different. Other people will notice you're different, but in a good way. Because God will be being revealed. Jesus will be being revealed to those other people who take notice of you. And like Joseph, we can experience the blessings. We can experience God's hand. We can know that the Lord is with us. No matter what circumstance, no matter what situation, no matter what difficulty, what hardship, or how far away from we seem to be, God is with us. But until we submit to God's authority and we begin to serve faithfully, we will not experience the way that Joseph experienced it. We will not experience it in a way that it reveals itself to others and they notice God at work in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to look into the life of Joseph once again. And Father, I pray that you will be so real in our lives, that you will be so prominent and and, and so imminent in our lives that people will notice. And Father, that we would look at the way that you have used us and the way that you are using and the way that you are going to use us and define our terms of success by you, not the world standards. We're, we're not here for the applause of men. We're not here for trophy. And Father, we're here to glorify your name, to lift up the name of Jesus. And I pray that even through the example of Joseph, that everything he did, you blessed because you were with him. That we would not forget that. The fact that you promised to always be with us. The, the, the fact that you promised to never forsake us. 
just as you did with Joseph, that we would be faithful, be faithful servants of yours. And we pray these things in Christ's name.